Hi, this is O'Connor, and I'll be presenting this Supply Chain Transparency, Sustainability and Compliance in Post-COVID World. Now, the big idea I want you to take away in listening to this today is thinking about future research projects that are relevant to challenges in the supply chain going forward. So I'm briefly going to go over the setting of the post-COVID supply chain, what's going to look like, the challenges that I've been facing, and then I'm going to present some examples of research topics that I'm currently undertaking in the area of transparency, sustainability and compliance. So let's get moving on this, shall we? As you know, setting the scene, there was a lot of panic buying. There was a supply of PPE, the demand for PPE. There were bottlenecks in the supply chain that came out from that. And then there was also the lingering effects of the trade war. All of this created a greater attention on the supply chain. And we knew that as a consumer, because we saw the supermarket shelves were empty. And it was just amazing that it happened in just about every country in the world that had supermarkets. Even when it, we go back to the supply chain and looking for PPE, there were challenges in ramping up production capacity because right, what happened was middlemen got into the game back in February, March in 2020 and actually put down millions of dollars of cash in factories to buy up capacity. And so when the government sought factories to supply PPE, factories could not supply the government because they were not paying money. Governments were expecting to pay after delivery, but that was not the case. You had to have cash down to commit the capacity and the capacity was committed to middlemen. And then the middlemen were, were selling at higher margins to governments around the world. And so there was a lot of cowboys in this space. And as a result, it resulted in a lot of quality problems in the PPE that was delivered to various countries. An example of some of the price hiking that was going on, like in 2019, I bought a pack of 20 of N95 for 119 ringgit, and just over six, seven months later, that went up to 300 for a pack of 20, nearly a 100% increase. You know that you had to decide quick because you just had to put down money to buy capacity of the factories. You had to put down money with the factories to get that capacity because there was so much demand and it created so much challenges with respect to cowboys entering into the field because the normal capacity of factories in China was about 20, less than 12,000 and went up to over 28,000 within a matter of weeks when this dem global demand for PPE came on, on tap. In February, there was great demand for raw materials and labor in March that turned into bottlenecks with air freight because airlines were stopped around the world from delivering passengers from country to country and half the freight around the world, air freight around the world, is actually delivered in the belly of passenger aircraft. And so half of the freight capacity suddenly was not flying and so then there was a lot of bottlenecks back in March. Those bottlenecks were actually exacerbated by regulations of the Chinese government requiring suppliers of making PPE to actually register to actually, if you want to export, you need to register to supply domestically PPE. And a lot of the factories did not have that registration and they had to get registered before they can actually ship export. Then in April, you had the air freight going up even more, and then regulations came into being in terms of export regulations where the China government required that all factories exporting needed to be registered and there was going to be tighter control at the customs before products left China to make sure that the factories were registered. All of this creating new bottlenecks, all of this creating new challenges for the supply chain. And it really made sea managers around the world of multinationals to open their eyes to think, wow, we are heavily dependent, not just on demand, but actually we are even more so dependent on having a regular supply because a lot of supply chain, especially in particular industries, was running so efficiently like in a just-in-time mentality that those supply chains were caught out. And this is particularly 
challenging in the automotive industry where everything is just in time and there are huge bottlenecks in that industry for example okay so what is the outcome of these pressures on the supply chain well we could separate it into SMEs and the multinationals now for the SMEs the pressure of the trade war and the supply chain challenges brought on by the coronavirus and inability to actually ship when you wanted and the inability to get labor when you wanted into the factory it actually forced SMEs to have a double think and have a stronger rationale for moving the factory out of China into another country like Vietnam, India, Taiwan, Malaysia, Thailand, Mexico, Turkey. Ah, they really had no choice. You had to move as a result of the trade war and then the COVID just made it even more, well, we need to sharpen, speed up our decision to move even faster if they had not already moved out of China. But for the multinationals, the move of factories, yes, that happened, but it was a percentage move because multinationals are more likely to have a portfolio of suppliers across countries versus SMEs, which may be wholly reliant on one or two countries at the most. And for the SMEs, or, you know, we're talking about smaller multinationals. Examples are GoPro, where they moved their factory capacity for shipping to US from China to Mexico. Rombo vacuum cleaners moved their factory capacity out of China down to Malaysia. And so they basically moved everything uh, for Rombo vacuum cleaners because they're a small company. Whereas you look for larger companies like HP and Apple and things like that, they are moving part of their capacity to other countries. It's not like they're moving from one country to another, closing one country and opening in another country. So, but for the bigger picture, for the multinationals, they don't just move for cost alone. Obviously, they have a much more interest in creating greater transparency in the supply chain, as well as trying to improve the sustainability of the supply chain, working with the factories, which they've been doing the last five years. Puma is a good example. Giorgio Armani is a good example. S. Oliver is a good example, where they're sending their design teams to the factory rather than communicating over email and speeding up the whole design process. Now, during 2020, that wasn't able to be done. And I'll talk about that. As a result, there's other businesses that have blossomed to to substitute for that decline in transparency because design teams cannot go to the factory and work directly with the factory floor. Again, multinationals also have, were challenged to think about, okay, it, it's very industry specific. And so for PPE, there is a greater pressure to maybe start having onshore production, especially in the USA, Europe, Australia, as well as offshore production. Whereas in other industries, it wasn't necessarily bringing back onshore back to the USA, it's about moving to another country, which was more friendly in terms of supply chain vis-a-vis -vis the trade war with US China. Ah, so it's very, very interesting. This is the context that we're in. And so interesting, 53 companies moving factories. We have actually started to analyze the reasons for why they are moving. And this is a very early stage process uh, illustration of what has happened out there and actually companies moving factories out of China. And there's a whole variety of reasons for why they're shifting. Trade war is just one of a number of reasons. Uh, labor costs, demand changes, cheap raw materials, ecosystem, government incentives. These are all other reasons for moving other than just the trade war. Okay, so that's the context. And we could actually summarize that context in terms of, well, here is the top 10 post-COVID trends. And uh, I put that under supply management. And the big area here is consolidation. But the big challenge here is actually trying to maintain the transparency which multinationals have pushed for in the last five years because of their reputation, their reputation risk. They wanted more visibility of the first tier, second tier, third tier suppliers. So they have pushed for transparency and uh, under supplier management. And 
unable to get that in 2020 so they've looked for alternatives and that's where the digitalization of supplier management has accelerated and vendors have come into this space offering digitalized transparent production communication with multinationals which are in another country. Under the area of supply location, there are challenges with moving from China into other countries. And there's also, as I said earlier, there are many reasons for that move. And then under compliance regulations and importers record, we can think in terms of increasing challenges for suppliers to be more compliant. Now, in terms of sustainability, I would put that under supplier management as well transparency and sustainability under supplier management under these top 10 post-COVID GSM trends. So what I'm going to do now, having set the setting, I'm going to talk about some of the research that I have started under supply chain transparency, under supply chain sustainability, and under compliance. Some of these research is more developed than others, and that may spur some ideas, it may spur questions for the connections that you may have to start research in Malaysia. Under transparency, as I mentioned earlier, that had actually gone down to zero in terms of design teams not being able to visit factories in China and in other countries because of various country lockdowns. Okay, so Pivot 88, which started back in 2009 with about a dozen factories and a dozen clients and vendors, has now expanded to over 12,500 factories and over 100 brands and vendors from all around the world who are relying on Pivot 88 tablet technology which are provided to the factory that are, that are supplying to the brand and then the factory inputs data into that tablet on daily as they go through the quality gates in the assembly process. And so multinationals have visibility digitally instead of through managers, their foreign managers, if they have shifted to the factory, but they cannot do so because the countries are closed down. And so this transparency has been enabled by Pivot 88 raises questions about to what extent will this continue? To what extent is this the new norm? And to what extent will this actually burgeon across into other industries because it was quite apparent that this digitalization of the management system and the Pivot 88 service actually blossomed and grew very, very quickly in terms of the apparel industry, but not so much in other industries. And it would be interesting to what extent does it grow in other industries. And there's the example of the tablet there. I want to give an example of a project that I've recently written based on over 1,200 complaints of overseas buyers of suppliers in developing countries. Now, majority of the complaints pertain to suppliers in China, but I just want to say that there are complaints of suppliers in Vietnam, in Malaysia, in India, in Pakistan, Turkey, and many other developing countries. As you can see, there are reasons for these complaints. There are scams, contract violations, quality scams, mislead times, lack of labor, price negotiation, compromised intellectual property. There are a whole range of problems, but what we did was we wanted to try and predict whether buyers, if they had certain controls in place, could they reduce the incidence of the really bad scam, that is scam and unethical activities where suppliers shipped a dodgy product and they took your money and you, could, you weren't able to contact them again. Now that's different from if the supplier shipped you a poor quality product, but you followed up with the supplier and they were able to make amends. Or, of course, you're still angry because you cannot sell that product, etc., and you'll complain, but the supplier is still there to deal with a complaint. It's not necessarily an intentional mistake made by the supplier, unlike the scams and un other unethical activities. So seeing that as a zero one, that is a one if the scam was really, really bad, or zero if it was just a myopic type opportunistic behavior, we want to predict whether if suppliers had certain systems in place, 
If buyers had certain systems in place, could they reduce the incidence of this really, really bad scam? So the data looks like this in terms of the stage of the relationship, the initial order, the reorder, and sampling and testing, but also the experience. There's a whole range of experience. There was a whole range of countries that the buyers were from. There was a whole range of provinces when we just look at the China suppliers only. We could also look at the type of stages of the contracting process, whether there was information on the business license was accurate. For the most part, the buyers found that it wasn't, but they still went ahead with the purchase. Whether QC took place, for the most part, 58%, no independent QC took place. Whether there's a formal contract in 77% of the cases, but in 23% of the cases, there was no formal contract. Whether there was a visit to a production site, well, 83% of the cases, there was no visit to the production site. So it's very, very interesting that there's a whole range of practices out there. And so what we find that those buyers that had a verified business process in place, they actually able to visit the factory or they had a third party quality check that is employing a third party order to go in and check that the supplier is legitimate also to check whether the product quality is legitimate before it is shipped to an overseas country and also whether there's a contract in place all of them were significantly associated with a lower incident of the worst case scenario scam. And so this is why we see so sea managers around the world are concerned about the fact that there's less transparency of the supply chain because you can see a lot of these mechanisms in place like a buyer visit by having a third party quality check they depend on having access to the factory. They depend on having a human access into the factory. And so the need for third parties is even more so in a post COVID environment. So that's the work I'm currently doing on transparency. If we want to move to supply chain tra sustainability, I guess the question is, can we teach a factory to be more sustainable? And so one way is we can learn, the factory can learn by factory visits by the multinational. They send foreigners over, they send design teams over, or they can learn by me and other experts giving pro bono advice, giving advice to the supplier, like what I am doing in this video here. Ah, so it's very, very interesting that that's one way that factories can learn and it's one way that they improve their sustainability. What's another way they can learn? Another way is to learn from third party audits, as you can see in here, where I've actually undertaken full factory audits to make to double check whether the factory has the right capability to actually manufacture and supply the product at a sufficient quality for the buyer's needs, the client's needs. And so they could either learn from pro bono advice or advice when people visit the factory, or they can learn when auditors <coughs> undertake factory audits, they go and check everything and then give feedback, or they go and do a product audit and because of the product audit, the factory learns because maybe they have to re manufacture some of the products that are rejected by the product auditor. Ah, so it's very, very interesting that these are mechanisms that can help a factory learn to be more productive. And in that same way, the factory can become more sustainable. Ah, so I want to talk to you about a project that I'm undertaking that is relevant to supply chain sustainability. And so one way we can think about this is is there a, some kind of relationship between a factory's product audit AQL outcome, AQL meaning acceptable quality limit outcome, and so you want to make sure that a greater percentage of your product meets the acceptable quality limit. And also you would want to know, uh, you have a starting base for the factory audit outcome because 
you want if you want to compare a range of factories according to their product audit outcome this dependent variable then you need to control for their capability or the quality level to begin with and one way is to look at factory audits only and then regress that on their product audit outcomes. Now also you'd want to regress their product audit outcome on prior product audit outcomes to see if they learn that way. Or do they learn from other controlling factors? For example, if the major customer is a US customer and they keep on pressing on the factory versus an Australian customer, which is much more lenient, for example. Or there may be other controlling factors like how large the factory is or which province the factory is or is in or which country the factory is in. Ah, so this is a model that we can think about. If we could have data that fills in this testable model, then we can start to learn about whether factory audits or product audits have a role to play in improving supply chain sustainability. Ah, this is very interesting if we can do that. So Here's what factory audits look like, and I've got access to over 500 factory audits, audit reports, where you actually go in and actually you rate a factory on its ability to supply a product at a certain quality. And these ratings are done by proper third party auditors. And I've actually done these factory audits myself. So there's the factory audit side. And there's another example of a factory audit, as we can see here. And then we want to see some of the data from these 500 factory audits that were undertaken that I've, I've collected from a third party auditor. And you can see that not all factories are the same and not all factories across different provinces are the same. Factories in Shaanxi are much lower audit quality versus those in Jiangxi or those in Guangdong or those in Shanghai. You can see that there's a variance in the starting quality of factories. This is the capability of the factory to make a quality product and the rating of the factory's ability rather than the product quality. So it's a starting point. We're setting a baseline here. Ah, and so we want to see and one way of another way of looking at this is that the higher the level of the factory order quality, the higher we would expect the sustainability and the lower the level, the lower the sustainability. But we want to know if over time do these factories does having a starting point in terms of factory outcome quality in terms of their own factory audit capability. Does that translate into better product audit out outcomes like AQL? Now, an AQL acceptable quality limit is all about it's a statistical limit based on amount of sample, the standard that you set and the number of major defects, which is that set at 2.5 percent and number of minor defects allowable set at 4 percent. And so auditor will go in, take a sample and actually test for the counts for how many major defects are there and how many minor defects are there. And that's how they come up with the AQL. Ah, and so here's an example of an audit report where there was five no major defects found. But in that sample of 80 pieces, there was allowed of five major defects. In the sample of 80 pieces, there was an allowance of seven minor defects and there was 17 found. So here, there was a decision that the final result is a failure. But we could actually statistically compute the extent that it has failed to meet that AQL limit. And this is the data that is going in as a dependent variable. And so what we have is AQL limits reported by Kima, which is a large third party auditor in the world, one of the largest. And I'm not using their data, I'm using data of another third party auditor. And you can see that the AQL limits is not just variance in China, but there is variance across a whole range of developing countries. And, and then there's other measures like ethical audit scores, but we're really looking at AQL percentages. And don't be surprised that the percentages are quite low because when you are ordering from a factory in a developing country, things are never going to be perfect. You cannot expect AQL 
meeting AQL standards at 80 or 90 percent. It's going to be much lower than that on average. Ah, okay. So can we merge these two together? And that's what I am. I'm actually merging the product audits matched with those factory audits to actually test a model that we get a current AQL. And we're looking at previous AQLs because many of these factories underwent many product audits. And then they've got the initial starting factory audit to actually control for factory capacity. And we want to understand whether the initial factory audit had any bearing on the current AQL or even controlling from that. Do they learn from previous audits that were undertaken at that factory? So at the moment, we see the product audit as being very central to what a particular buyer wants because it's part of the contract for what the buyer is contracted for with that factory. Uh, it's not that the buyer, does the buyer really care that that audit results in that factory learning and becoming more sustainable in future? Maybe not, no, that is not the first focus of any one buyer. But taken a sustainability view, we may think about these audits as being a sustainability mechanism. And that's what we're trying to learn here with this problem. Ah, so this is amazing. And then finally, we want to look at supply chain compliance. And here, this is something that is very, very new, very, it's an early stage, I really haven't got my teeth into this yet. But supply chain compliance, there's a lot of pressure coming from EU, coming from the US onto emerging economy suppliers in the area of compliance with various raw material standards that are going into products. For example, ROHS, Restriction on Hazardous Substances, or REACH, and so forth, where factories have to get products lab tested for various raw material content like cadmium, magnesium and other metals that shouldn't exceed a certain tolerance. Ah, okay. And so th this is a, what we mean by supply chain compliance when talking about products that are shipped to the US and the EU. That's one side of it. Then on the other side of it is whether a product fails to meet a certain promised standard. And this is where the RAPEX system in the EU is actually putting a lot of pressure on factories or on buyers, importers of record into the EU, because as soon as your product fails to meet a certain standard in the hands of a consumer, they start to use it. And if it fails, the consumer complains and there is a legitimate complaint and then the product is not working like it should, then the it is actually reported under the RAPEX system and suddenly that product has to be recorded across all of the member states of the EU. And that is fatal for any importer of record. It's not that you may be sued, which you could, illegal action could be taken against you, but suddenly all of your products can needs to be removed from the shelves everywhere in the EU as soon as there's one problem that occurs. That could be a little electrical short circuit or a fire. That could be some scooter where the wheel falls off and it shouldn't fall off. Uh, a little accident caused by a bike or some wardrobe that falls over. Little things like that. And then suddenly there's a recall across all of the EU. And that's the RAPEX system. This is a big red flag that importers of record need to be aware of. And so increasingly there are these vendors out there or fintech startups out there, not fintech, I would say more of a reg tech startup out there like Product IP that actually works with importers of records and tells the importers, oh, if your product is a children's bicycle, then here, here are the 20 different pieces of regulation that you need to comply with to protect your interests when you import that bicycle into the EU. Now, I've actually spoken to management in Product IP and have they've relayed to me and told me that of their thousands of clients, like the buyers are supposed to complete these regulations, the range from of completion, and we call that a fill rate, 
that a compliance rate ranges from less than 10% to 100%. There's a whole range. And so an interesting research project could be to find out what are the determinants of those buyers or what are the characteristics of those buyers who are complying fully compared to those that are not complying so well. And just to understand the buyer's awareness of these regulations that are creating liabilities for them as importers of record if they do not have complete records of compliance registered with the various regulatory bodies in the EU. And so that's a research area that I haven't started, but I have had discussions with Product IP on these questions. And so this is something what it may look like as we have discussed with Product IP. A final area of supply chain compliance, like this pressure from the EU, from the US, through importers of record, is also going to be put onto factories as importers of record find that it's more expensive to get cited out for a recall. They're going to put more pressure on the factory. That pressure could be in actually ramping up third party audits. That pressure could be in ramping up lab, lab testing that factories have to undergo. And so factories are going to find it, it's going to be more expensive to actually import acceptable products, export acceptable products to EU, to the USA. It's not just importers of record paying this. They're going to put pressure on a factory to export quality products and that products that comply with international regulations. That is not always the case as we speak today. And so it'd be interesting to get a factory perspective on this area of compliance. Now, just rounding this up, what I was talking about today is that is there's a new norm, like there's some old norms that are you know lingering on before COVID into post COVID, but there are new norms or new pressures from C managers of companies around the world to we need to maintain supply chain transparency we need to also be aware of supply chain sustainability because we need to make sure that factories do not close down because of covid and this has happened we need to look after the factories but more than that we think about how can factories improve naturally or gradually because they are being audited to the eyeballs in certain industries. And so this is one thing that you we want to take away from today's talk. And finally is the notion of compliance where we have EU regulations putting pressure on importers of record. And ultimately that will actually put pressure on factories to get things right. And looking at this from the angle of importers record to what extent are they complying and what are the characteristics of those complying more than others or we can go back to the factory and ask the factory questions about the challenges that they are having giving this new regulatory push to have products next to perfection when they are imported into the EU and into the US. So these are interesting areas of research that I think are relevant going forward. They touch on sustainability, they touch on this whole notion of transparency, and also the increased compliance or regulations that are on products that are shipped to EU and the US around the world. Thank you and Welcome any questions on this area. Bye for now.